The TRIPS Festival in January 1966 was the sort of last legal moment for LSD. And Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters had been doing these things called acid tests. Uh, and the acid test was sort of put forward as, uh, can you pass the acid test? And many of the hippies were dismayed by that kind of competitive standpoint. But really it was um, an all-night entertainment. And the way you passed the acid test, you made it through the night. There'd been a series of these things, they were funky, they were sketchy, they were uh, offhand, and they were fun. And uh, in late 1965, one of the pranksters came by my place in North Beach in San Francisco and said, we want to uh, do a big one, a trip festival in you know, some big place, and uh, we're going to do it. And I knew in my heart that they were not going to be able to pull that off, but that it ought to happen. So I picked up the phone and uh, called the people at Longshoreman's Hall and said, we want to do this three-day thing over a weekend, and uh, it'll be wild and crazy, and it'll be music. And they'd had some uh, rock musicians here before, so we sort of knew what it was, and the price was low. And uh, so it just went ahead and started happening, and uh, I got help from many other people, including Bill Graham, who then, uh, as a result of that, did the Fillmore and the whole series of uh, what he called uh, Lights and Sounds of the Trips Festival carried on for years after that. And what he meant by the Lights and Sounds is it was a multimedia event. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff happening with slide projectors, with film, we didn't have video then, uh, and with very good music. The Warlocks, uh, which had been the house band for the so the acid chess had just become the Grateful Dead. They had Saturday night. They absolutely rocked and established themselves as a great West Coast band that night. Uh, and people came in costume and uh, acted weird. There was some LSD being passed around. The sound was fabulous. There was uh, various kinds of electronic music from the Tape Music Center. And it was a creative fest that um, apparently set in motion the realization there were 10,000 hippies in San Francisco and nobody knew that. And uh, we were off and running, we had a movement. I suppose I made the move from the uh, sacred version of LSD to the recreational version of LSD and then to the zero version of LSD. By 1969 I'd had my last trip. Um, I saw it in the, in the various modes, and I, I saw that uh, people who had a series of good trips would, would keep on trying to have that good trip, even though they were having a series of bum trips, and you could uh, lose your personality in the course of that. But um, the kinds of revelation was pretty darn good. Um, I remember some LSD that I had in, up on a hillside in Big Sur looking out over the ocean. And uh, I saw a ship passing, and that little haiku poem, Pale Blue Ship, Pale Blue Ocean. And the, that kind of clarity was the sort of thing that you could get with it. It was not a mind expander, it was a mind concentrator. You've ever really looked at your hand, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, in my case, I had one of the few documented cases of a genuine um, creative experience in the idea of on LSD, on a rooftop in San Francisco, realizing that if we ever got a photograph of the Earth from space, it would change people's perspective on everything. And so in the spring of 1966, I wound up selling buttons. Why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? And that was a direct result of an afternoon on a relatively low dose of LSD, thinking about nothing other than what the photograph of Earth might be. I'd also seen that the hippie thing was going severely romantic, but there were two technical guys that everybody, not everybody, but a lot of us were listening closely to, and this was Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan. And me particularly, Fuller, I later got to know him and, and went to some of his talks. Um, and the whole Earth Catalog really came out of Buckminster Fuller's perspective on that tools are the most fundamental thing that humans do. And so uh, I wanted to, I'd seen, I'd been part of founding of a couple of communes, and I visited a number of communes, and the communes were trying to reinvent civilization, which was bold and admirable, 
and doing it poorly because they were all liberal arts majors who dropped out who had no idea how to do anything, garden or build a building or anything. So my perspective was to try to bring, because I've been trained as a scientist, as a biologist, to bring a kind of a respect for science and for technology and engineering and making things to that movement. And the whole Earth Catalog access to tools was an effort to basically enable the skills that would be needed to reinvent civilization. And I started the whole Earth Catalog basically with about twenty thousand dollars uh, that uh, I was using from an inheritance from uh, my father who had died, and I thought, well, we'll put twenty thousand dollars out to a crowd that we'll invite. We won't tell them it's going to be, and we just had this party and what became the Exploratorium in San Francisco, and. Um, at midnight, uh, uh, an actor came on stage and said, here's $20,000 in $100 bills, and Stuart would like this group to decide what to do with it. And uh, the mic is open, come on up and say what you want to say. And the deal was you would come up to the mic and you would hold the $20,000 in your hand and come up with your idea. My hypothesis was that people would have, you know, under that kind of pressure, really great ideas. And the reality was what they had was really terrible ideas, <laughs> just one after another, terrible ideas. There'd be things like, well, we should just give it back to the Indians. And uh, my wife was in the audience, and she said, got an Indian over here! <laughs> and she's calling, I don't want it! <laughs> it was uh, a lot of that back and forth. And it wound up, uh, the debate went on all night, and people gradually filtered mm -hmm. away. And at one point, the money went out into the audience, mm -hmm. and most of it came back. Mm -hmm. And uh, by late morning, one guy who had built, burned a dollar bill in front of everybody mm. was given the money, a guy named Fred Moore, and who never had any money galore. He took it home, didn't trust it in a bank, buried it in a jar in his backyard, proceeded to have subsequent meetings where he loaned it out to various things. And he became one of the founders of the Homebrew Computer Club, which then basically invented the personal computer.